Well, good morning. morning. Man, it is good to be back here with y'all today, continuing in our Life in Community series. This morning, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as we've been journeying through from chapters 12 through 14. So we're in 14, and we're going to look today at verses 13 through 25. So if you have a paper copy of God's Word, if you have it on your phone, if you want to begin to make your way there, if you have a paper Bible, you're not really familiar with how to use that. You can find a table of contents at the front of your Bible. It's going to let you know how to locate the book of 1 Corinthians. And then just know as we make our way through today, the large numbers are chapters and the small numbers are verses. Hey, would you follow along with me as we have opportunity to read and apply God's word? The Apostle Paul writes and says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and with lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. Even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? For if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God really is among you. Would you join with me in prayer? God, I thank you that, that you give us such a clear picture there at the end of this passage of, man, what in the world are we doing here today? Uh, We want to see Christians built up. We want to see them grow closer to you. And we want to see those who do not know Jesus come to declare him as Savior and Lord. We want to see their hearts opened, the secrets of their heart disclosed, you moving and stirring in their hearts, calling them into a relationship with Jesus. And so, God, that's our prayer for us this morning as we gather together. God, our prayer is that as we join together in the careful study of your word, is that you would unite our hearts, that you would call us to be a better reflection of Jesus in this community. God, I pray for those of us in this room that we're so uh, besought, overcome with distraction, with difficulty, that as we were singing earlier, as Emery was leading us in that song, that when we sang the words, it is well with our soul, they were just hard uh, for us to say. They were difficult for us to get out and to believe in ourselves that they were in any way true. So God, I just want to pray for the one in this room, for the folks in this room, that that's the reality of their lives right now. That you would come near to them in the Holy Spirit, that you would provide comfort for them, that they would be encouraged by their brothers and sisters sitting around them in this church this morning. God, that they would have a sense of your love for them, your care, your purpose and that they would just be ministered to in this time, that they would be encouraged and comforted. Father, I just want to come into this place, and we're so incredibly thankful to be able to partner together with so many churches in our community. 
uh, both in Hardin County and beyond. God, you've given us such great partners for the expansion of the gospel, so we just pray for their strength today. God, I pray that to, today, as the churches in our community gather together, that they would just have such an overwhelming experience of your spirit in their midst that you would spur revival in those places of worship. God, towards that end, we pray for their people that they would follow you well, that they would love their pastor and their staffs, that they would love you well, and that we would see so much harmony uh, break out in these churches that we wouldn't be distracted by those things that we disagree on in church, and, and you know we do that really well. But God, that those churches would be so impactful in their communities and their schools and the places of employment. Toward that, towards that end, God, we pray for the pastors of those churches, that they would live faithfully unto you, that they would love you, they would submit their lives to you, and that they would feel the encouragement of your spirit this morning as they stand and speak and trust in you to change lives and change hearts. God, we ask these things in your son's holy name. And they all said, amen, amen. amen. So a number of years ago, I was a summer missionary in Hungary. I was in Budapest for the summer and didn't speak Hungarian at all. Uh, I could order a chicken gyro with extra white sauce, and I could actually order a second one on those days I was really hungry. But that was kind of the end of my language ability. Uh, every Sunday, we had to go to a local church, and the guy that I was living with was a guy from Mississippi, and he just said, you just go in, you just do just what I do, and we're going to be all right. I was like, Okay, yeah, that's, that's a little bit ominous, whatever. So we go in, and it's the Lord's Supper, and, and they practice the common cup, which if you're not familiar with that, it's just like a communal drinking bowl. And so everybody passes it around, and you, know, you just kind of drink, sip, pass to the next, drink, sip, pass to the next. And, and that's just how it works. And so it made it to uh, my roommate Jason, and so Jason drank, he wiped the cup, he passed it to me, I drank, I wiped the cup, I passed it on, it's no big deal. So we leave, and he's like, I'm glad that real well, went real well for you. It's like, man, I sat there, like, I didn't have a clue what people were saying, and I did what you told me to do, I just followed the example. And so what do you mean? He's like, well, when I was first here, I didn't have anybody's example to follow, so they handed me the cup, and so I drank, wiped, passed. <laughs> and uh, come to find out, you don't wipe your face, you wipe the cup. They were not real happy. <laughs> so some of you today, like if you're new to church, you're wondering like, do I wipe my face or do I wipe the cup? Because you've not grown up in church. This isn't, this isn't regular for you. You drove on our campus and you're desperately looking at signs, like trying to figure out which entrance to go in because you don't want to walk a half mile from the kid's space into the worship center. And like, you're trying to find the bathrooms because you got all juiced up and sugared up in the atrium. And you're like, I got to find an outlet before I make it into the worship. And so church isn't something that you're accustomed to. But there are others of us, you've been in church your whole life. Maybe you've been in this church your whole life. And for you, it's a radically different experience. So you walk in, you're like, hey, buddy, hey, pal. Hey, uh, I can't remember your name, but you're super important to me. Love you, players. God bless you. <laughs> and so you're just kind of making your way in and no one's sitting in your seat. So you sit there and you're comfortable and you're in the stadium seats or you're on the floor. And this is just kind of rote for you. You're just kind of engaging in the way that you always engage. And, and unfortunately, the way that you've engaged in this is you've essentially turned on adaptive cruise control. So the people in front of you slow down, you slow down. The people in front of you speed up, you speed up. Your mind is not engaged. Your heart is not engaged. You're just going along because this is what you've always done. So in the middle of singing, it is well with my soul, you found yourself singing this, but you're not evaluating your life at all. You're not looking and saying, although the storms and the billows come, it is well with my soul. You're just singing the words and you're making no application to your heart, no application to what's going on in your life. And because today what you become is what you're normally engaging in. You're an observer, not a participant. So what Paul calls us to in this passage is a radical reorienting of our hearts as we engage in worship, saying, let us not be observers, but let us be participants. And as we participate in worship, let us consider how our participation in worship is impacting Scotty's life, how our participation in worship is impacting Lamar's life, how our participation in worship is impacting people on this other side. They're like, we don't even know because we only ever sit here. What Paul is calling them to is an abandonment of this individual perspective of worship. This is, I don't really care what's happening in the lives of the people around me. I only care about what I can get 
out of it. And how that looked in Corinth was engaging in tongues to the exclusion of what God had to say, wanted to say, and was doing in the lives of the other people in that service. So look at how he begins to correct their errant individualized perspective. Verse 13, what they did was they spoke in tongues. And you'll remember from last week that Paul says, when you speak in tongues and there's nobody to interpret, to tell you what they're saying, you're only building up the person. You're not building up the body. So he says, instead, what you should do is if, if you are a person who speaks in tongue, you should pray that you would interpret. Because he says, when I pray in verse 14, in my spirit, my mind is unfruitful. Do you see what he's saying there? Paul's saying, whatever ways you find yourself utilizing, using your spiritual gifts for encouragement, for edification, for helps, you should use those to the glory of God, but to the edification of those around you. So while you're primary, primarily seeking to glorify God and using these gifts, you're also recognizing that the way I use my spiritual gift has an impact and as it is important on the lives of those around me. So he finds this person there in Corinth, and they're so excited that they're able to speak in tongues, and they're so excited they're able to experience God in this way. And he says, listen, if this is you and this is how you uh, have been equipped by the Holy Spirit and salvation to utilize the gifts God has given you, pray that you could interpret. So he's reorienting their hearts to others and saying, listen, your experience in the corporate gathering, your experience in worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ should not be primarily about what God is leading you to do, but it should in some sense be for the equipping and the impacting of the people around you. Like the people on the row beside you if you're sitting in the stadium seats, the people in front of you and behind you if you're sitting here on the floor. How are you considering the people around you and how you're engaging in worship and how you're utilizing your spiritual gifts is impacting them, is hitting them, and is bringing them closer to Jesus. Look at what he says in, in verse 15. I'm just, oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. Verse 15, Paul gets down there. He says, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I'll pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I'll sing praise with my mind also. Verse 16, otherwise I'll give thanks with my spirit. How can anyone from the position of an outsider say? Everybody say amen. amen. Flip over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, Paul is going through and he's visiting with a church there in Ephesus. And he's talking to them about the importance of what their worship, uh, how it rolls out, how it's impacting the people around them. And I think it's a quite a change from some of us in our experiences in worship. Chapter five, the latter bit of verse 18 through verse 20. When you've got it, somebody you'll got it. He says, be filled with the spirit. This is the command. Be filled with the spirit. Surrender your life for the direction of the spirit. When we do this in the middle of worship, he says, addressing one another, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always in everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in some sense, when we are gathered together and when we're worshiping, when we're singing songs, like, so you're over here and, and y'all are singing, it is well with my soul. And you consider that the person on the road, like just down from you this year, like 2022, 2023 rolling in has been horrible for them. So they've gone through this like gut-wrenching divorce. Their kids are taking sides. And so like the wife seeing her kids go with the husband, the husband seeing uh, his kids go with the wife. And so this family is splitting and it is melting down and all of life is misery and woe for them. But even in the middle of these things, they find themselves singing, it is well with my soul, tears running down their face. It impacts you so differently because you know this about them. So that there's a way in which they're engaging in worship that is transformative because they're not engaging in rote. They're not just seeing and singing with empty hearts and empty minds. They're seeing and singing in such a way that they're a person in process and God is stirring up this awesome thing inside of them. So when you see this person and their life's been miserable and they're able to sing praise to the Lord, what does it do for us? It's so encouraging. Now to see the person whose life is perfect and everything's great and they're out there driving a Maserati or a Lamborghini or whatever and you see them singing it as well with my soul, what's going on in your soul? You're like, oh yeah, I'd be well in my soul too if I were driving your car. Oh, I'd be well with my soul too if I hadn't invested everything I had in Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, I'd be well with my life too if I had this and I had that and I had this. This comparative understanding of what God is doing to this person. But just think, 
when we gather here, we're all going through different things in our life. Some of us have lost family members this year. Others of us, our families have kicked us out. We've lost jobs. We've lost our health. We've lost friendships. And when we give the people around us an opportunity to know us, to journey through the hardships of life with us, and we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with them, we're building them up. And we're being built up by them. Because we're doing so in a way that is vulnerable, that is engaging, that is transparent in our lives. And we're peeling back all these various layers that seek to allow us to engage in worship safely. We're saying, I'd rather engage in worship in a way that is transformative, but not just for me, but for the benefit of the people around me as well. And and y'all, that can look so different. So maybe divorce isn't your thing this year. Maybe it's unemployment or maybe it's addiction or maybe it's depression. When you wake up every morning, it doesn't matter how beautiful the weather is. It doesn't matter how nice people are to you. Life just feels empty. It feels purposeless. You feel purposeless. You wonder if there can ever be joy again, but it doesn't feel safe to share that with anybody else because culturally what we've created is a place when somebody says, how are you? Our automatic response is, fine, I'm okay. And so we're expecting each other to engage in dishonesty because that's so much more comfortable than being honest. And somebody says, how are you? And you say, you know what? I'm really struggling. And I, I, I can't even articulate to you why I'm struggling. I just know that things just aren't right. They aren't right in my marriage. They're not right in my friendships. They're not right in my, my workplace. It's that level of vulnerability. It's that level of honesty that allows us to engage in worship in a way that is completely transformative and allows us to be built up one to together. Verses 16 and 17, he, he takes it from the issue of, of praise and he really brings it to the issue of of prayer. He talks about it being thanksgiving. Look back what he says. He says, you're in the middle of this and and you're giving thanks with your spirits. You're praying in tongues and you're thanking God in the spirit. How can anyone in the position of an outsider, somebody who walks in and they're just not familiar with what's going on, how can this person say amen? And he goes on to say, listen, you could be doing a really solid job. Like, I'm not saying you're not doing a good job, but how can this person be a part of this process if they don't know what you're saying? if they can't in any way be engaged and involved with this. Essentially what Paul is telling us is that when we pray corporately and when we're giving thanks to God corporately, it's not just one person standing on stage. It's not just you know, groups of us sitting around and, 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 and kind of gathered together and praying for these things and doing so one individual and one individual and one individual. When we're doing this, there should be this very real invitation for the people around us to say amen. Now, that doesn't mean we have to shut up and quit praying. What that means, and Paul is saying in this, is that that's them saying, yes, I agree. Because amen is a transliteration of a Hebrew word, which meant this is correct, or this is right, or yes, I agree. That's what we're doing when we pray. Certainly we're praying to God, but it has a horizontal application too. And we're seeking to edify the people around us. We're seeking to build them up. Even as we pray and ask God to supernaturally intervene, it's hitting the people around us and we're asking them, we're allowing them to be encouraged by the things that we're praying to our God in heaven. Amen? See what we did there? Paul goes on, and he he essentially in this passage is saying the basic orientation of our hearts in worship, should be seeking that which is best for another rather than that which is best for me. And it sacrifices personal preference for the edification of another believer. That's what we do together. I don't know what you thought you were signing up for. I don't know what you thought you were going to do when you came into this place this morning. But if we're really gonna be faithful to God's word, if we're really gonna do what his word calls us to, then our investment this morning as participants should be this desire that in us that is unwilling to be satisfied with anything less than seeing all the other people built up beside me. And so what this asks us to do is to take a running list of all those things which are preferences to us. So just take a moment and just kind of write down like three preferences you have in worship. And as you write down those three preferences you have in worship, and maybe it's 
I, I want more hymns, or I want the volume louder, or I want the room quieter, or I really just want Juniper just kind of wafting. I don't know. That's how you get down. Listen. And so <laughs> when you begin to write those things down and you have that list, and these are things that are very important to you, just put a slash all the way through them. Instead, put a question mark beside that. And the answer to that question mark is what makes Jesus more paramount? What makes it easier for the person beside me to worship Jesus? And if you're, if you're in your 50s, maybe the question for you is what makes it easier for a person in their 30s to worship Jesus? If you're in our student ministry, maybe the question for you is what makes it easier for my parents and my grandparents to worship Jesus? If you're a person who's been here your whole life, and so you've been at Severn since 1781 with the founding, and so for you it's, oh, I just want to make it to my chair, which is awesome. Like, if you've been here since 1781, y'all, we will hook you up with a wheelchair. That is awesome. We need to get you on TV. But if that's you, maybe, maybe what it looks like for you is saying my preference is to keep things as they were. But I just want to put a line through that. And I want my preference to become, I want severance to be that thing, to be that church for the person who's not yet here. And I want our style of worship and I want our manner of engagement to be most paramount and most pronounced in the lives of those who do not want to be a part of our church. That's how we get there. By seeking to leverage and change and reorient our hearts to make it not where we are the most important, but where somebody else gets to be the most important, somebody else's preferences, because I want to build them up. I want to edify them. Now, Paul is kind of moving through and talking about this in terms of tongues, but he changes, and he really begins in verses 20 through 26 to talk about how these things work out practically within the church. And so he starts with something that's just a good place for us all to kind of set our minds. And everybody say, I need to grow up. I need to grow up, y'all. We need to grow up. Look at what he says in verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Some of, some of us, we've kind of introduce into ourselves the understanding that Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. And so what we want is a childlike faith and yes and amen, because kids aren't asking all these various questions. They're not confused and, and preoccupied with all the various things that we as grownups want to know, right? Like how to fill out a tax form. But as we work our way through these things, he says, don't be a child in your thinking. Some of us, when we came to faith in Jesus, we recognized that we were sinful. We recognized that God sent his son Jesus to take on our sin, to die for us on the cross. And three days later, God helped him to raise uh, up from the dead. Jesus overcame sin and death. And so he asks us to confess our sin, to forsake it, and to turn to Jesus. And we came to know him. And in coming to know him, we professed him publicly in the act of baptism. And we would say, hallelujah, that's awesome, right? That's awesome. But some of us, that's it. You've not grown since then. You're baptized. You publicly profess Jesus Christ as Lord. But there's been no maturing in you. And it's evident. Because one of the things that happens in the life of a child is we find that the kids are just kind of naturally selfish, right? They're self-focused. They're myopic. Everything that kind of exists in my small world is the most important thing and it should be the most important thing to everybody. So what do kids do when they don't get their way? They cry, they moan, they complain, they throw a temper tantrum. And some of us as grown people, all we've done is use bigger words, but we're engaging in the same process, we're engaging in the same things, because what has happened for some of us is we came up out of that water proclaiming Christ as Lord, and we were done. And so maybe you look at it and say that was a failure of your parents or a failure of the church to disciple you. Regardless, equip yourselves to grow. So he said, do not be children in your thinking, but be infants in terms of evil. So we're here, we're, we enter into this conflict. In some sense, it's evil to engage in selfishness. So what we have to do is put to death our move towards selfishness. Put to death our move towards being satisfied in the flesh. Put to death our move towards being okay or being cool or being, being normal culturally. We wanna put those things to death. And what does he say? You need to be adults. You need to be mature in your thinking. So there's this maturing process that has to happen in the church, and it has to happen for the people of the church. And to the degree that it doesn't happen, 
we're gonna have the same fights every year in every decade. It's just gonna look a little bit different. It's gonna look a little bit different because culturally we are becoming different people. And so what it looks like for us, what it's gonna take for us to move on off some of these hills that people keep dying on and we keep stacking body on top of body on top of body over trying to solve the issue of what worship style is best or what temperature is best or what volume is best is all of us collectively just saying, y'all, we have got to grow up and move on. Are we willing to do that? And I think for some of us, the answer is gonna be no. You're not really willing to do that. You're willing to give lip service to any great number of changes that we might suggest. But in your heart of hearts, it doesn't make you feel like you're worshiping Jesus. It makes you feel like you're losing. And you can't stand to lose and you can't stand to let go of the past. And so you keep pressing and pressing and pressing to advance your own agenda. And when you can't find it here, you're gonna go somewhere else. And you may for a time find that you find it at another church. But 10 years from now, things are gonna change there too. And when you find that you no longer have traction and you can't use your money or your influence or your power or your prestige to get what you want, you're gonna leave there too. Because you, in your heart, you're not pursuing Jesus, you're pursuing your preference. This is my plea for you. Please, grow up. Abandon childish thinking and pursue maturity in Christ. Pursue what makes for the gospel and making it more paramount in the lives of others. Please grow up. But Paul gives us in 21 and 22 something that I don't care how many times you read it, 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 it it's obscure, right? You know, it made sense in the church in Corinth. They were there in the back row, even the, the dullest of them saying, uh-huh, I got you, I got you, Paul, I got you. And that's not us, we're not in Corinth. So let's just read it and let me just try and unpack it for you. Paul writes and says, in the law it is written, by the people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people even when they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Verse 22, thus, so he's making its application, tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but believers. What Paul is doing is building this principalizing bridge saying that the Old Testament and the New Testament are connected and it's a solid bridge that Jesus uh, walked across repeatedly. And so what he's doing is describing how tongues are being impactful in the church there in first century Corinth and what it was like for the Israelites. So the Israelites, God raises them up out of slavery in Egypt and he begins to take them to what the Bible refers to as the promised land in Canaan. And as they're moving along, right before they cross into the promised land, Moses begins to kind of go back over the law with them. And that's in the book of Deuteronomy. And he wants them to understand if things go really well for you, if you honor God, he's gonna bless you. And this is what that's gonna look like. And then the latter half of chapter 28, he says, but if you disobey the Lord, it's not gonna be a blessing, it's gonna be a curse. And this is what this is gonna look like. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, in verse 49, this is how he describes what's gonna to happen to them. He says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand. So they move into the land, they're enjoying the benefits of God, and then bit by bit, person by person, family by family, their hearts begin to turn away from the Lord. So God sends prophets to tell the people, hey, listen, you're turning away from the Lord, turn your hearts back to him, and, or he's going to bring the curse upon us. And they say, okay, well, that sounds really good. They offer a lot of lip service. Their hearts don't really come back to him. And so God calls and sends in the Assyrians to bring his wrath upon the people. And then Isaiah takes it, and Isaiah essentially recognizes what God said through Moses in Deuteronomy, what's happening in his day. And so he wrote these words in Isaiah 28 and verse 11. For by people of a strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to these people with whom he has said. So when the Assyrians show up, Israelites don't have the foggiest what they're saying. And so they could be walking up and saying, uh, pardon me, do you know where the restroom is? And it just sounds aggressive and angry. They're like, they're here for us, they're going to kill us. And, uh, which they actually were, but nevertheless. And so they're in there and the Israelites don't know what is being said. And Paul says, man, 
tongues are a sign for the unbeliever, and it indicates to them that they are, if nothing else changes, they're going to face the wrath of God. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand what's taking place in the service. And so they feel this dislocation from the service. It feels foreign to them. And then you'll remember that Paul had spoken of prophecy in weeks before. His prophecy is that thing which is, it encourages us. As believers and followers of Jesus, those who know him and follow him, when we hear the word go out, it's an encouragement to us. It strengthens us. It comforts us. Because we believe in God, we know him, and he loves us. So Paul says tongues is a sign for the unbelievers, and prophecy, prophecy is a sign for believers. It points to something greater. Now, as we get in verses 23 through 25, Paul really begins to focus, in some sense, on the experience of the lost person in a worship setting. So in verse 23, he says, If therefore the whole church comes together... So you got all the people in the room together and everybody in there is speaking in tongues. So everybody's edifying themselves. Nobody's concerned with anybody else around them. A lost person, an outsider comes in. He says rhetorically, will they not think that you are all out of your minds? Will they not think that y'all, y'all are all straight up crazy? So imagine this. They've heard about this sect, this new religion called Christianity. And they've heard that it's about sacrifice and they've heard that they worship a God who died and then dying came back to life and they just think, this is, this is nutburger crazy. Like, I gotta see this for myself. And their experience has been the Dionysus cults where everybody gets in there and they just get wild, crazy drunk and just do whatever and, 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 and all the various ways that they wanna get down. This is what they do. But they've heard this Jesus is different. And so they walk into the worship service at First United Methodist Church, Corinth, and they walk in there, and everybody is just speaking in tongues, and it's just this cacophony of chaos. There's no order. There's no clear direction. And it keys in their mind, this is no different than last Thursday when I was gathered with the Dionysus cult. Everybody's pursuing what makes them happy, Nobody seems to understand what anybody else is saying. This is complete and utter chaos. As Paul says, when we engage in worship in such a way that is solely for our individual enjoyment, and I don't consider anybody around me, what that says to the lost person who comes into this place is, we're not really here for you. You're not really invited in this place. You're not really welcome in this place. We're not creating a space for you to come, to experience, to know, and to be loved by God. And y'all, to the degree that we do that, we're not mimicking, following, pursuing, and extending the love of God to the very people he sent his son Jesus to come and save. Amen? So he goes through, and he says, say say you're not doing that. Say you're not Everybody's just kind of pursuing their own and everybody's doing their own thing. Say instead, what you do is you say, we're gonna engage in prophecy. We're gonna engage in communicating the word of God and giving people an opportunity to respond to the word of God. He says, what that does is it begins to move in them and it really does in some sense what John says or John records Jesus' words in John 16, eight. It convicts the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so the lost person, the person who does not know Jesus, comes in there and they begin to hear of this Jesus who lived a perfectly sinless life, who died in their place, who overcame sin and death. And this answer that they have to give to God on the basis of how they've lived their life can be righteous if they accept the way Jesus lived in place of the way they lived. And all they have to do is profess him as Lord and turn away from their sins and follow Jesus. He says, if that's how you engage, and everybody is there and they're engaging in prophecy, this person hears this, they hear the word of the Lord go out, and something transformative happens in their life. It says the unbeliever, the outsider enters, he is convicted by all the testimony, the way he sees 
the lives of people lived around him, what he hears them say, testify to his heart that he is far from God. They call him to walk in submission to God. He has to, he's convicted by all. He gives account by all. Verse 25, it says, the secrets of his heart are disclosed. He finds himself in there under the gaze of God. He doesn't feel judged. He doesn't feel far from the heart of God. What he finds is that every secret sin, every hidden motivation in his heart is peeled back and the eternal God of the universe sees it and bids him come. And that's different than everything he's ever experienced. That's different than everything she's ever experienced because her life, his life, forever before that, if they were to come up to somebody and say, listen, this is my sin and this is what I'm struggling with. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm addicted to pornography. My wife and I are divorced because I had an affair. I, I, I struggle with same-sex attraction. Like These are the issues in my past. Everybody they ever shared that with in their life up until this point, you could see the look of disgust come over their face. You could see this look of felt shame come upon their face. But in this moment, in this gathering, when the deeds of their heart are exposed, it's met with love. Because it communicates to them that the Son of God took on that shame. He took on that sin. In taking on that sin and taking on that shame, he gladly bore for them in his body the penalty and the punishment poured out on Jesus by a just and holy God. So their response is to fall on their face in worship. This is what we're here for. We're here to build up the body, to do those things individually that help make much of Jesus in the lives of the people sitting to our left, sitting to our right, sitting before us and behind us. And we're here to extend an invitation to all those who do not know and follow Jesus and say to them, come and be loved. Come and be forgiven. Come and be restored and made whole. This is why he has placed us here in E-Town, in Hardin County, in Central Kentucky, in the U.S. and beyond. Let us pray together that would be who we in fact are.